talk about medicine throughout the ages. There is something very wonderful about human life. Just think of a few things before we get into medicine. The age of the earth, the planet on which you and I exist, say is something like 8 billion years. So on the planet which has been around for 8 billion years, we, human beings, in any form, whether you call us the Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals, the, the, the primitive human beings, we have been on the planet for about a maximum of 250,000 years. And if you have a calculator, a cell phone, a pen and paper, if you did a fraction of 8 billion vis-a-vis 250,000, then what it means is if the earth was like 24 hours in age, then the human beings have been on the face of the earth for five minutes. So of every known creature, every known form of life, how did life origin on the planet? Our idea about origins of life is extremely unclear. It was a very inert situation, if you believe the Big Bang theory of genesis of life, when there was an explosion, when you had carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, somewhere in the cosmic atmosphere, there was a, there was a kind of a chemical reaction which was catalyzed, and all these inert elemental compounds got together to synthesize a sequence of biochemical substances which later on manifests itself as life. The life of a human being, the color of a butterfly, the shape of a plant, the grass on the soil, everything originated from the elemental compounds and we do not have the vaguest idea. There are theories like the primordial soup and so on and so forth. But the funny thing of, of life is we do not know how it started and we do not know what happens or when is it going to end. So the so-called domain of human knowledge, we are like a transit passenger in the airport. We have, been, we have started a journey which we know we will end someday and all our preoccupation right now is for the journey itself. The beginning is unknown, the end is unknown. And that is the story of life till many fundamental creation, questions of creation has, the puzzle has to be resolved someday, somehow, somewhat. Now let's come back to medicine. So we have been on the surface of the planet for about 250,000 years. If you look back at human history, then perhaps even if you consider the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Mesopotamians, the oldest human civilization probably goes back about 10, 12,000 years, maximum 15,000, not longer than that. That is the, that out of 250,000 years, only 15,000 of those 250,000 years can our species claim to have some kind of civilization. And through the ancient civilization, whether it was the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Assyrians, whoever you looked at, people thought what was disease about. People were living, people were alive, and periodically we would get sick. We would be inflicted on by diseases. And for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we were under the impression that things like the plagues of Egypt was considered to be a fact that the gods are angry. It is a divine intervention. You are getting sick. Why are you getting sick? Because the gods are angry. Whoever their god was, the Egyptian god, the Greek god, the Assyrian god, the Sumerian god, the South American god, the gods were getting angry. And thereby the gods were cursing you from up behind the clouds in heaven. And that accounted for sickness. And that is why we were getting sick. Some of you may have seen the movie, The Ten Commandments. In Ten Commandments, when Moses comes into Egypt, you see, it's a different story. 
that Moses inflicts plague upon Egypt is a very nice story, but obviously scientifically it's not true. So for hundreds of thousands of years, human civilization was under the fear of the person behind the clouds who will make you sick, thinking that sickness is a curse inflicted upon by God. When did, when did we first make an attempt to treat diseases, to make sick people better and not just let them, leave them to die somewhere or the other? The first attempts of treatment happened in temples. And this is the temple. The, the picture you see is the Greek god called Asclepios. In medical college Calcutta, we used to have a festival called Esculapia that comes from the Greek god called Asclepios, the Greek god of medicine. And you may see this symbol being used in various medical, uh, medical associations, organizations, symbol for doctors, many things like this. Who, what is this symbol about? This symbol is the staff and snake of the Greek god Asclepius. It was in that temple that ancient medicine used to be practiced. Because who was practicing the ancient medicine? There was nothing as doctors, nothing as surgeons. There were priests. So it was the priests in ancient society who thought there were people of moral values, people of compassion who thought that, look, so many people are falling sick and dying, so we need to make them better. So it is the religious institution that took on upon the practice of medicine, and we are talking about something like 10th, 12th century BC over here. There was a funny practice where we still do not know how and why it used to be done. There is a practice where many skulls have been excavated and you see, this is not restricted to any one part of the world, only in Egypt, only in South America, all over the world. And this, there is, there is because of some uh, ancient concept, people used to drill holes in the brain. It was called trepanation. We call it trepanation. We don't know what it used to be called in that era. And because of this, tre and this trepanation, a lot of skulls have been found out tens of thousands of years ago. So some form of surgery, some of form of treatment was being done. But no scholars so far have unearthed the secret that we call it trepanation, why this is, was being done. Probably somebody clever amongst you can take this subject for a PhD research someday. The real advent of thinking in medicine comes from this great person, from a soft, small island of Kos. Kos is a very small island just off the mainland of Greece, to the west of Greece, and his name was Hippocrates. You have heard the name of Hippocrates, you have seen it in movies, you have seen the press, the people telling doctors, go by the oath of Hippocrates. Hippocrates was not a lawyer, Hippocrates was a physician. And why Hippocrates is important in modern history in the history of mankind is, from Hippocrates starts the era when we realize the separation of divine from the disease. Hippocrates starts the th thought process that look, we have to look at things differently. People are becoming sick, there are different kinds of problems, sickness, death, etc. And there must be different causes for it. It is all not due to because some god is angry somewhere. So let's start thinking. And in that philosophy of Hippocrates, he wrote quite a few treaties, quite a few compendium. Hippocrates encouraged the separation of the priests from the physicians. And he formed a kind of moral code of conduct that how we should behave, how doctors, we do, you didn't call them doctors then, healers, how healers should behave. And that moral, like in this is election time now, we are going through a moral code of conduct. So Hippocrates in 5th century BC writes down the way the physicians and healers should behave themselves. So if you are to think, about one date in history, that is the watershed line for the evolution of medicine, that era is 5th century BC.
There must be some people interested in history. Fifth century BC is a wonderful time. I don't know what was the astrology or the cosmic connections in fifth century BC. Because in fifth century BC, you have Hippocrates in Greece. Whom do you have in India? In Indian civilization, Gautam Buddha. Gautam Buddha comes with his first socialistic thinkings in 5th century BC. We have Charak, Shushrut, everybody appearing in 5th century BC. So look, even in those days when there was no internet and no connection, human philosophy and thinking seemed to spread worldwide. And there was a churning in ourselves that let us start thinking. We cannot leave everything to God's cursing human beings and stuff like that. And in our ancient Indian uh, practice, from 5th to the 4th till the 3rd century BC, we saw the evolution of Charak, Shushrut. We saw the evolution of Ayurveda as a science. And a lot of thinking, thought process and progress was made in ancient Indian medicine in that era. When you look at temples, Especially when you next time when you look at Buddhist temples, when you go to Ajanta, Elora, when you go to Nalanda, look at these Buddhist Biharas. Why were Buddhist Biharas shaped like this? Because they were nursing homes in absentia. People were lifted up from the street and the Buddhist priests and monks were actually treating the sick people in these Buddhist Biharas. So similar to the theory of Asclepius, the first treatment Today we want to make temples out of our hospitals. Remember, hospitals first started in the temples because sickness was first treated in the altar of the gods. That is how human philosophy uh, evolved. You know, it'll take me a good part of two days. If you have two days to spare, give me five hours each day, I can tell you a more comprehensive history. But today we have to march ahead. So from the pre-era of Christ, if you take a step next two, three hundred years, a whole lot of activity happened in the area of the world. An extremely fertile area of human civilization was today what we call the Middle East. The Islamic world, the Persian world. The world was not always like this, what you see it today about terrorists and bin Laden and Islamism and fundamentalism. Remember, the Islamic world, the Middle Eastern Islamic civilization, was a cradle of scientific fertility. And without them, modern European civilization would not have come anywhere. So many of the words that was done in medieval Europe, from Europe, they were connected by land. It traveled into the Middle East. And we have the manuscript of Galen, the manuscript of medieval physicians, which were, where do we get them from? We get them from the cities which are now bombarded, Damascus, Tehran, uh, Baghdad. These were the places like universities, universities, academicians, these were the temples of knowledge. And a couple of people, who were the real thought leaders in the world of Islamic medicine in 10th century was the great Ibn Sina. There's a wonderful movie on Ibn Sina. Go back and see it sometime. Ibn Sina, uh, there were no specialists those days. He had treatment for cataracts. He was doing caesarean sections. Ibn Sina knew how to treat fractures. And people used to travel the length of Europe to go to Ibn Sina to to learn many of his medical insights. And there was another great thinker called Al-Nafis. Al-Nafis was based in Baghdad. You know, I'll tell you a little bit later that in Europe, we got to learn about human circulation 600 years later. This man 600 years earlier, today we are able to decipher, translate, decode his writings. And Al-Nafis told us about human circulation 600 years before William Harvey. There's a wonderful painting. You know, we digress to art a little bit, art and medicines. The study of medicine is almost like study of medical humanities. 
So medicine and art is almost intertwined with one another. The great uh, Italian Renaissance painter, Raphael. Raphael painted a painting called the School of Athens. When you have two minutes, Google School of Athens. And the School of Athens is not just a wonderful painting. This is like, like a group photograph you take nowadays. So Raphael took a group photograph of all the important scientists, physicians, healers, thinkers in, 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 in medieval world. And it's a, wonderful, uh, uh, it's a wonderful representation in one photograph of the who's who of science and thinking in, in medieval Europe. But we have a debt to pay to art as I told you today, that there was nothing, there was no subject called medicine. The original subjects that used to be taught, the first universities appeared in the 11th century. The first university in the world is the University of Bologna, 1096. There was no subject of medicine, there was theology, there was languages and there was law. There was nothing called art, science, etc., etc. So the mere fact that people were looking into human biology, human structure, uh, how are we actually built? What does the body composition look like? What does the skull look like? The brain look like? The stomach look like? The organs look like? Who were the first people who asked these questions? Not doctors, but artists. And the person with whom this artistic Inquiry into medicine starts is the great Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci is become immortalized in the world for his Mona Lisa. But, but when you read about Leonardo da Vinci in the second phase of the Italian Renaissance, you realize that Leonardo da Vinci, he was a mathematician, he was a designer, he was an engineer. He said, and he thought that he was a useless artist. And Leonardo thought that he was rubbish as an artist. And he never, in his whole life, Leonardo lived a long life, almost 78 years. And in his whole life, he only painted 25 pictures, full-blown canvases. canvases. And uh, Mona Lisa took almost seven years to finish. So in the back of Leonardo da Vinci's mind, he was a polymath. He was a strange man. He used to write in the wrong direction. He used to write from left to right. Sometimes he used to write from right to... His work on optics is groundbreaking. So Leonardo da Vinci, you know how he used to study? Leonardo da Vinci used to bribe. Whom did he bribe? He bribed the people who were looking after the graveyards. So the moment somebody died and got buried within 6 to 12 hours, Da Vinci used to bribe the people in the burial grounds, get the body exhumed, and he used to dissect and draw wonderfully graphically all the structures. He studied the human embryo, our musculoskeletal system, our circulatory system, the human heart. And another reason why in a, within a span of about 30-40 years, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of development in this field was rivalry. Leonardo da Vinci was a senior artist and like happens in Tollywood and Bollywood, you have one hero being challenged by the other. Leonardo da Vinci was an artist, was being challenged by Michelangelo. And Michelangelo suddenly became the talk of the town, the number one in the, like, you know, in top of the pops list. Leonardo da Vinci's popularity was going down. He was an older man. And in the last phase of his career, Leonardo da Vinci, as he was drawing the Last Supper, one of his most famous and mysterious paintings, as he was drawing, drawing the Last Supper, this is Michelangelo, that Leonardo da Vinci, in one day, he would draw the Last Supper for half an hour and almost for two, three hours, twice the thrice the time Da Vinci gave to studying human anatomy. This is Da Vinci's own illustration of the human heart. If today Da Vinci appeared in first MBBS and drew these pictures, he would get very high marks. They are remarkably accurate. So this is the huge debt that medicine owes to art 
uh, in, in its knowledge evolution. So now we come to a phase when thanks to the artists, thanks to the medieval science, we get some idea what the human structure is about, some idea. Still, there is a lot of clarity. We still know what the liver is like, we know what the heart is like, we know the muscles and bones, but there is still lack of clarity about structure and function. We do not know. We can, we can draw you the diagram of a liver, but in the 15th, 16th century, there was no idea how the heart works. There was no idea what the liver does. There was no idea what the different uh, tubes in the body were doing. And we will come to that a little later. Now, another milestone in science was, if you think about diseases, now we are talking about, we have made our journey another two, three hundred years, and we are in the early 19th century. And in the 19th century, the disease that was really killing people by tens of thousands, the disease of that era used to be infective diseases. There were a lot of infections, acute bacterial infections, chronic bacterial infections. So infectious diseases was at its worst in the world. For every 100 people in the world who died in the 19th century, 90% of the deaths would be due to infectious diseases. In the early 19th century, the human life, very few people would live beyond 50 years. Infant mortality rate was stupendous. And then people started thinking about the cause of the disease, the microorganisms, how to sterilize them, how to identify individual bacteria and start isolating them. And three names are very important in this area. One is Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, you know, you, you talk about pasteurization of milk. So that is who it is after, Louis Pasteur. Then we had Lister. Lister, following on from Louis Pasteur's work, did a lot of, did, did the original work on sterilization, initial ideas about vaccination. And Robert Koch, Robert Koch was very important in the Asian perspective because he did a lot of work on chronic infections, tuberculosis. That was a kind of disease that was killing people. That were the killers of the world. You did not need bombs and terrorists those days. In those days, the terrorists were the bacteria. You know. And when we talk about infectious diseases, I'll talk a little bit about cardiovascular diseases next few minutes. Another fantastic thing happened. A gentleman called Alexander Fleming. I happened to work in England in the same hospital. Obviously, I'm not as old as Alexander Fleming. And where my department was, the cardiac surgery department, was in the next corridor to the room in where Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. So as everybody was literally breaking their heads on the wall, how the hell you fought infection, how to identify the wound infection, the war infection, the germs. You know why it all happened? It all happened because Alexander Fleming, one night when he was leaving his lab, he forgot to shut his window. His window was left open. And his bacterial petri dishes on which the bacterial plates were done was right in the front of the window with the window open in contact with the air. So the next morning, Alexander Fleming comes to the lab. He identifies that the spores have grown, that the, he, he managed to grow the anthrax, the penicillus uh, fungus from which penicillin was discovered to fight the staphylococcal infections. And uh, uh, Fleming kept, uh, kept it as a secret to himself for quite a long time. And then some people told him, you are being stupid. This is a miracle cure today. In this fungus lies the antidote to the bacterial staphylococcal infections. So because it came from the penicillus fungus, it was called penicillin. But the person who actually developed penicillin as an antibiotic that could be used world over was the Cambridge-based Australian scientist called Florey. 
And Flory, you know, is a, medicine is a very interesting story. How, how Flory uh, made mass production of penicillin possible? You did not have any biogenetic labs or uh, 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 very sophisticated pharmaceutical companies those days. How he got penicillin was, when people were treated with penicillin, he never wasted their urine. He used to go from patient to patient and ward to ward and collect every drop of urine the patient was passing. And from that, the extractions of penicillin was kind of recycled all over again. So those were the early days. How human, how we, the doctors, the scientists, fought over the infectious diseases. Now from the infectious diseases, from the early 1900s, we are now living in the 2000s and we are dominated by the diseases now which are called the lifestyle diseases. And the lifestyle diseases is dominated by cardiac problems, heart diseases. Why is the heart important? It's the only pump in the body. It pumps six liters of blood a minute. If you ever cut an artery, the blood would go about 25 to 30 feet. If you joined every blood vessel in the body together, you could go around the world 15 times. And in one day, your heart has worked for about 100,000 times. And from the time you are born, if you live to the age of 70, your heart would have worked for four crore heartbeats without a rest. No holidays, no Durga Puja, no Eid, no Christmas, no strike. It is the only organ known in science and biology which has this capacity to work for a period of 70 years, 80 times to 90 times a minute without rest. It was not made by Apple or Samsung. It does not need recharging. There are no power sockets. And this organ is working on biological energy. This is an artificial heart, I tell you later. Note here, when we talk about lifestyle diseases, it is not just storytelling to you today, but these are the factors which are causing a lot of damage to this organ which is working tirelessly to keep us alive every single moment we are living. And these are the factors of smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, diet, which people will talk to you about today, excess body weight, high pressure, stress. So this is a very valuable organ in our system and we must know how to look after it. A little about, you know, I mentioned to you about medieval science and human circulation. Leonardo da Vinci was drawing fantastic pictures about the human heart. Nobody knew what the heart was doing in there, but utter confusion, whether circulation started in the liver, in the heart, what was happening. But everybody knew one thing. And that one thing is, if you stuck a knife in the heart, you're dead. So everybody knew for 200,000 years, that if, you, if, you, if there is somebody you dislike, you have a knife in your hand, put it through the chest, it goes through the heart, fellow dies. Why? How? What's the reason? What is this machine doing? We didn't have any clear idea at all. And who comes up with the solution? It comes from a young person, 25 years of age. He was an Englishman, William Harvey. He was doing his PhD. It, it, it used to be called a different degree those days. As I told you, the first university in the world, Bologna. So he wasn't, he wasn't studying in England, he was studying in Bologna. And Bologna, he just looks at how the blood flows in the veins by, by tying tourniquets in the hand. William Harvey in 1632, no fancy machines, no uh, advanced labs, just by observing the, the passage of the blood, from the veins and in the arteries by trying to case, he comes to the clarity of thinking that look, circulation is happening because the heart is pumping. 
Blood is going from the heart through the arteries and coming back by the veins. Now you would not even get this as a two mark question today in your question paper. But that was where human knowledge was stuck for 600 years. We did not know the answer to this question till William Harvey unraveled it. And this time, 1630s, you know, I have this habit of turning through my history book. Fantastic things were happening in the world, like 5th century BC. Within, within five miles of William Harvey used to live another gentleman by the name of Isaac Newton. Almost the same year, the theory of circulation and the theory of gravitation comes to the world. You know, you can have a separate lecture on Isaac Newton sometimes. Isaac Newton lived, lived for almost mid-60s and all his work was done by the time he was 27 years of age. Optics, light, gravitation, law, forces, everything, calc discovery of calculus. By 26, 27 years, Isaac Newton's scientific dossier was finished and completed. What he did for the next 40 years of his life was completely mysterious. He's a very unknown element in a relatively modern era. So William Harvey is a founding father of human circulation. So we know the structure. Now we have an idea how the circulation and all this happens. And what is the next question? In the era of lifestyle diseases, people knew that the structure of the heart could be defective. People knew that you could get chest pains, angina, heart attacks because there are blockages and people were dying. So how to diagnose? How to know what is wrong? It is not enough just to allow somebody die and do a post-mortem and say, oh, you know, we are so sad, the child has died because there is a hole in the heart, or this grown-up man has died because, you know, there is a blockage in the arteries. That is not, medicine is not about recrimination, medicine is about diagnosis. You have to tell from before what is wrong. So diagnostic activity became now the focus of attention. And there are many, many, many workers who's worked on this field. I'll just name two to you. One was this gentleman by the name of Eric Frostman. Eric Frostman in 1929, he said that, look, there has to be a way by which our circulation, the heart, we can take pictures of it. Today it is called angiogram, catheterization and all these things. But Frostman said in 1929, there are ways and means we can take pictures of these organs. Nobody believed him. He used to make friends with his nurses, with his colleagues, people working in the hospital. And Eric Frostman had many girlfriends. And the reason he had many girlfriends was he used to allure them into the cath lab, use them as a subject and do all his experimental studies. He was expelled from the hospital as a mad person. But when years later we look back at Eric Frostman's work, that was a foundation of cardiac catheterization. And many years later, in 1958, the modern cardiac angiography was done by Mason Soltz. This is a picture. This is what you call a cardiac. What is an angiogram? You know, you come across somebody who's having chest pain. Oh, uh, there's a block in the heart. But where? Heart has arteries like this, taking blood to the muscle. So what these people were trying for the last 50-60 years was to take this photograph, which through an X-ray machine and radio contrast lets us know that where the problem is. Now that you know where the problem is, the question comes that how are you going to treat it? But there was one problem about treating the heart. You can operate on the stomach, the bones, the brains, everything. But how do you treat the heart? Because number one, the heart is moving all the time. And number two, if you ever put the heart to rest, the rest of the body gets no blood supply at all. So you can say, fine, I, I know what the problem with the heart is. I'm going to fix it, I'm going to repair it, I'm going to stop the heart. Okay, very briefly, for say half an hour, 30 minutes. I'm a brilliant surgeon. 
you stop the heart for something like 90 seconds, the brain will die. So there was no solution. People knew what the problem was, nobody could fix it because you cannot stop the heart and maintain circulation to the rest of the body. That was the next puzzle. And people like this, John Lewis, etc., they devised a machine. This is called the heart lung machine. And the heart lung machine changed the future of, sur of, of heart surgery completely. Like God bless it doesn't happen. If suddenly the power goes off in the hall right now, what will happen? The standby electricity will come in. So when we stop the heart, we put the heart on a machine outside the body so that the whole work of oxygenation and circulation is happening through the machine, which is the heart-lung machine. And this made the first modern heart surgery possible late in the 1950s. And the surgery that really changed almost the destiny of humankind was the treatment of heart blockages. Because as I told you, we had known about the bacteria, we had discovered antibiotics, so a lot of infective diseases were controlled. But as because of various things, diabetes, food habits, hypertension and all that, people were coming down with heart attacks, blockages in the heart, and now we can take pictures. We know where the blockages are. So how to treat it? And the solution came from this young man called René Favaloro. He had not passed his exams. He was the youngest person in Cleveland Clinic watching the senior doctors operate. And he had the idea that, look, instead of doing something very complicated, I can just, it's like the flyover in Park Circus, your ma flyover. The road underneath is absolutely congested. So why don't I do a flyover at the top so that the blood goes from A to B, jumping over the blockage, and the problem is resolved. So the simple idea came from René Favaloro. But much before him, this person, Alexis Carroll, was the last person ever to, last surgeon ever to have got a Nobel Prize. Because even the great Hippocrates has said that, look, you can treat a lot, you can try a lot of treatment, but trying to treat or operating on the heart and blood vessels is dangerous. People will die. Don't do it. And for thousands and thousands of years, it was never done. This man, who was born in a very poor family, who taught him how to suture the heart and blood vessels? No teacher. He was taught by his mother. His mother was a poor woman who used to stitch torn clothes. And you will see in many laundries in the para, people stitch clothes. In Bangla, we say ripu kora. In English, they are called seamstresses. So his mother used to earn some hard-earned money by stitching torn clothes. And this surgeon saw his mother every night in the midnight oil, stitching torn clothes with a special technique of suturing. And he said, why can't we apply it to vascular surgery? And he applied it to vascular surgery. It worked wonders. And it was only due to the work of Alexander Carroll, of Alex Alexis Carroll, who learned from his mother that the entire speciality of cardiac surgery ever came about. Cardiovascular surgery is the youngest speciality in medicine. It's been only around for about 60, 70 years. And this is, you know, as I told you, you have the flyover out in the roads. So we take a piece of vein from maybe a vein or an artery somewhere in the body. This is a block in the vessel. You just jump over it from one spot to another and the problem of the blockages are resolved. That and this operation is the most common operation ever performed in the history of surgery. It is the most scientifically documented procedure. And at one stage, you know, there is still more than hundred, that there are more than 10 lakhs coronary bypasses being done in the world even today. But along with coronary bypass, you know, young people like you, young students, youngsters, they're always thinking. 
So a youngster, a young, a young cardiologist started thinking that look, all this surgery is fine, but can we repair some of these blocks without actually doing a cut, without actually incising? Why can't we go inside the tubes? And this young person, Andreas Grunswick, he came up with an idea of an angioplasty. And in angioplasty, what you do over here is, I don't know why this, and in angioplasty, what you do over here is, we'll just go forwards a bit, that this is a kind of blockage you have in the artery, which is stopping the blood from reaching the heart. So through the arteries, through the arteries, you get access into the heart with the cardiac catheters. And you have this thing like a balloon. And what this balloon is doing is actually inflating. It is flattening the obstruction. It is creating a passage all over again. This is the technique of angioplasty, which has been a significant development, probably the most significant development in the field of vascular science over the last hundred years. But it is not enough to give pressure. It will collapse again. So to prevent it from collapsing, the spring-like structure is placed inside. And that is what you call a stent. You will hear a lot of people talking about stents. This is what a stent is about. These stents come coated with medicines so that the cells from inside the stents do not regrow again. So an angioplasty and a bypass surgery, in the simpler blocks you do bypass, in the more complex lesions you do an angioplasty. And these two things together really changed the mortality, the risk, the millions of people who were dying helplessly from cardiovascular condition. These two treatments changed it dramatically. Diabetes. I need to tell you a word or two about diabetes. The first person that should come to your mind when you utter the word diabetes is this gentleman. I'm sure all of you know who he is. Right? Shami Vivekananda, Narendranath Dutta, etc. Person, the poor man died at the age of 39, 1903. His blood sugars used to be around 600. Normal blood sugar is around 120. There was no cure for diabetes. Nobody, he was diabetic, diabetic from the age of 18 or 19. And diabetes is not dangerous because the sugars are high. Diabetes is like rust that affects the whole system. Diabetes is dangerous because it attacks the heart, the eyes, the kidneys, the nerves, all structures. Even for Shami Vivekananda, you know, when, you know, throughout his life, there's an important story to it. When he approached Maharaja of Khetri to go to Chicago, Khetri was his sponsor, Maharaja of Khetri. He bought him the ticket to the ship that took him to America. So he requested the Maharaj, can I have a ticket for a single cabin? Maharaja said that, look, this is a sannyasi. Of course, I will give him a single cabin ticket. But the man has no pleasures in life. He is a total ascetic. Why does he want a single birth ticket for? He never realized that Samiji was quite guilty, ashamed of himself because of his diabetes. He had to go to the toilet every half an hour, 20 minutes. So he was you know, embarrassed in public to do that. So that is why he had requested. And later on, in one of his last visits to Shillong, few months before he died, when his kidney failure had set in, heart failure and kidney failure, Shami Vivekananda had almost stopped passing urine end-stage renal failure. The poor man is writing to his disciples that, look, I think I'm getting better because after so many years of life, my frequency of urination is getting down, decreasing. But till that time, there was no treatment for diabetes at all. And our great worry is we still don't know what diabetes is due to. The precise cause of diabetes is still unknown. We have some treatment for it. 
And it was Banting and Best who in the 1919 to 1920, which is a good 17 years after Vivekananda died, that the initial discovery of insulin and the treatment of diabetes, treatment, I should not use the word treatment, it is control of diabetes. We are still not treating diabetes because whatever you do not know, you cannot prevent. So we are only treating diabetes in a very half-hearted way, even today, because we need from amongst you some clever mind to do that path-breaking research that will tell us the cause of diabetes. Another aspect has been genetics. We know the big structure of the human body, the eyes, muscles, nervous system, skeletal system, cardiac system, etc. But in the molecular biology is concerned, the ultimate constituent of the human body, the human genome, that was detected by Watson and Crick sometime in the 1950s. The double helix that all of you have to memorize and draw diagrams in your exam was the work of Watson and Crick from the University of Cambridge. And in 2003, like decoding a software, if your computer goes wrong, what does the repair shop do? It looks at the software. When your cell phone updates, what does it do? It uploads and downloads software. So the whole human genetic software was decoded for the first time in 2003 in a worldwide project called the Human Genomic Project. And now we are trying to find out the genetic causes of most diseases. Medicine has also been dominated by the problem of cancer. Cancer is where you have cell replication happening in a very aggressive, in a very damaging and a very uncontrolled way. There are thousands of people who've done selfless work in the field of cancer. But if one name has to be taken, that is the name of Madame Curie, who along with her husband, Mary Curie and Pierre Curie, did pioneering work on radiation. And this woman, look at her picture. She herself died of cancer, knowing very well that day in and day out, the work that she was doing in the lab, being exposed to radiation, that is ultimately going to kill her. And it did kill her. She, she literally killed herself in her own thesis, pro, in, in her own uh, quest for developing advanced radiation. And few months before she died, this is Albert Einstein visiting Marie Curie, because when Einstein knew, everybody knew that Marie Curie would not live for very long. Einstein came over and visited her. Across the history of medicine, we've had a lot of limelights. India has also contributed, not as much. We have had Ronald Ross here in Calcutta, got a Nobel Prize for it, by isolating the Anopheles mosquito spread cycle of malaria. Malaria is not an Asian disease. Malaria is a European disease. Malaria is called malaria. It means mal air, bad air. Malaria originated from Spain, from Mediterranean. Malaria was brought to India by the Europeans. And malaria spread in India when the Indian railway was being constructed because people used to uh, dig trenches and holes with stagnant water and the mosquitoes bred over there. But Ronald Ross identified the plasmodium vivax spread through the mosquitoes and there was some control of malaria. Similarly, we had you, the next time you go through uh, Loudoun Street, it's actually you and Brahmachari Street, where you and Brahmachari uh, discovered urea stibamine for the uh, cure of Kalazar. Uh, it was very sad that he, he was not in contention for a Nobel Prize because he got a very early patent of it. And the most tragic, but the most brilliant Indian doctor in recent times has been Dr. Shubhash Mukhopadhyay, who did absolute brilliant work in in vitro fertilization, test tube baby. We never recognized his work. The same year, Steptoe and Williams did the same research from England and were considered as a pioneering father when actually 
Shubhash Mukhopadhyay's work was a few months ahead of Step 2 and Williams. Now before I end in the last minute, healthcare is medicine is not about fantastic people and fantastic science. Medicine is also about the reality of the heat and dust on which we, our society stands. India is not about party politics. India is a country which with a glorious past civilization history went through terrible 300 years of colonialism. And in this 300 years of colonialism, the entire socio-economic fabric of India was distorted. A prosperous country in the world, when we came to independence in 1947, we were like a colony of beggars. In 1947, the life expectancy of an average Indian was not even 40 years. And every, we had very few hospitals. This medical college, SSK, my PGMR, Archicor, was not meant to be for the common people. They were only very VIPs of the world got into hospitals. And everybody else was left by the village side, by the roadside, where you had this jharphuk and this kind of medicine, and the, they were just left to die. So, in post-colonial India, when India became independent, we became an independent country. But because of financial constraints and also some problems with our social attitude, we were not spending as much on health and education that we should have. There has been a lot of demand for it from the common people, from the society, also from the political parties. And healthcare in India carried the curse of being, you know, the reason a family almost got financially crippled was not because of loans etc for some other reason but because some member of the family had actually become sick. So all this fantastic science you have heard about does not have any meaning unless it can be applied to our lives and times. So applying science to society is as much a duty of medicine as it is to learn operation and names of drugs and medicines and formulas. So in our world, if you look at the world today, the green parts are the parts where you have good health care. The red parts are the parts where the health care is very unsatisfactory. And the black parts are actually the worst. And look, India, the whole of Southeast Asia, is still at a, at a kind of stage where our health care delivery to the people, all this fantastic knowledge is useless unless it reaches the people. We have a lot of work to do in this area. Some work is happening because you may have heard in the press there is so much of argument and counter argument between leaders and party A and party B and party C. We do not realize that even the government is thinking in terms of population health care program, central level, we have Shastu Shati in the state level, and many of these things are being planned in the model of the national health system in the United Kingdom, and sooner it happens the better. So all of you who are aspiring to come into medicine, to be doctors, you will read a lot of books, you will practice a lot of specialty, but please do remember that our work and our speciality is useless unless it, it finds its true application. But we doctors, we in medicine, we have achieved something. And what have we achieved? We have not won elections, we have not won seats. But look at the life expectancy of the world. From 1850s, from the median life expectancy of 40 years, today worldwide, human life expectancy is almost in 80 years plus. I told you about the beginning of life, the animal kingdom. Think, the tiger, the lion, the dog, the rat, the cat, the mouse, 
No other animal lives longer today than it did 5,000 years before. But human beings, we, through our thinking, our thought process, we have been able to almost double the life expectancy of the human race. This is a product of thinking, of science and its application. India is following a similar curve. From our pre-independence life expectancy of 40 years, today the average Indian is living for 60, 65 years, which is a huge achievement in our terms. So it is not all negative, it is not all gloom and doom. Forget about what the political banter is about. Your generation, the future is in your hands. You have to hold it. You know, we go to many hospitals. We go to many places to do clinics, see patients. And I will end by showing you the clinic, the hospital, which has, lay, which has made a lasting impression in my mind. I once did a clinic in Andaman Nicobar Islands and the hospital in Andaman Nicobar Islands is a part of this building which is called the cellular jail. So it's a part of the cellular jail where 589 Indians in the freedom struggle were kept imprisoned and tortured. And in the same building, a wing of the cellular jail today functions as the hospital. So one, as I had finished my clinic, seeing patients, just next door to my clinic, I saw an exhibition. And this was the exhibition. So friends, young men, young women, boys and girls, when we think of our future, these are the people who remind us what the future of India is about. So when you and I do medicine the next time, we will look at science and we will look at society. And we will have to remind ourselves of the duty and the pledge that we owe to our nation. And, non and not just for the sake of telling you of the story of his diabetes, we end with the words of this great man who said that there is no room for any kind of negativity. If there is a problem, the solution lies within. And that is what medicine has taught us for the last 3,000 years. Thank you.